Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today, I am joined by Tim Durkin. Welcome, Tim. Well, it's very, very happy to be here, Amy, and thank you for inviting me. And just to give the audience an understanding of where you're calling in from, where is it you are right now? Well, I am about 75 miles southwest of Dallas, Texas. Um, I lived in Dallas for uh, 30 years, and then we recently, at the beginning of the pandemic, moved out more to rural Texas, a small town Texas, um, and we uh, we enjoy the country a lot. Fantastic. So how have you been entertaining yourself recently? Well, um, I do a lot of reading. I uh, have been a passionate reader all of my life. Um, I grew up in a uh, in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, I had a lot of books in my house, and I had a lot of books in my school. And I discovered early on that I could go anywhere, be anybody, go at any time if I uh, if I started reading books. So that became my big entertainment vehicle. So. From my earliest days until now, I try to read three to four hours a day. Uh, I do get up early um, and I I start reading very early. Uh, Now, when I was working in industry before I started my own company, uh, of course, my reading was cut back, but my listening to books on tape, because I had a significant commute, that, that actually increased. So... I've been doing a lot of that, and I've been doing a lot of connecting and reconnecting with friends, both old and new, such as yourself. Um, It's been a very interesting effect of the pandemic that in many ways, in most of my friendship relationships, we've actually become closer, even though we've not seen each other in person. And um, I've had the opportunity to meet people around the world. I have a number of friends now in the UK, uh, in the West Coast of of the United States, um, in other parts, just because we're doing a lot more Zoom calls with uh, small groups uh, that share similar interests. So um, I've been uh, I've been quite busy, and I'm also finishing putting the finishing touches on my second book, um, which is Points of Impact. As I teach and train and develop leaders, um, my book Points of Impact will be uh, 100 insights for new and experienced leaders. Should be out about February. Fantastic. And with your points of impact and your teaching and training leaders, is there a particular sort of niche that you're in, in in, in leadership? It it is. um, About six years ago, um, I started reading about companies and seeing companies that were failing to live up to the challenges that were presented to them. But they were major, major challenges, such as somebody uh, hacked into their information processing system or their market disappeared, like retail uh, stores were were challenged by the online retailers. And and so I, I, I kept seeing those situations arise, but the leadership didn't correspondingly arise to meet them in many situations. And there's turnover at the top. So even though I'd been developing leaders and training leaders for 25 years, it became clear to me that we needed to develop leaders that could operate in this new, much more uncertain environment. And then I found out that this environment actually has a name. And it's a a combination of a four letter acronym called VUCA. V as in volatile or volatile, uncertain, complex, 
and ambiguous. So industries began to, many industries started finding themselves in a VUCA environment. Healthcare is one because in the US there was a new legislation. There's a um, declining reimbursements by insurance companies and expanding role of insurance companies in medicine. So healthcare went into a VUCA environment, then retail, as I previously mentioned, uh, then banking and uh, and uh, every everybody. Well, it looked like at one time, 75% of companies would face a VUCA environment. And so I trained for that for six years. Then 2020 happened and the 75% turned into 100%. And Whereas a lot of people weren't interested in me developing VUCA environment because they said, well, it's, that's kind of a downer, you know, it's, it's not, there's nothing glamorous or sexy about that. And I said, well, for some people, there's nothing glamorous or sexy about the challenges that they are meeting. Well, the pandemic changed it and uh, all companies are at some level struggling for survival. And the skills that I'm teaching and have been teaching for the last six years are uh, to prepare leaders to succeed and continue to get good results in the VUCA environment. So did you evolve into this work or, or do you feel that you've had some kind of calling towards it? Oh, that's a very, very good question. And uh, um, I know that you have a lot of UK listeners and listeners from around the world. And I very much worry about sounding brag or bragging like a typical American and so on. But I actually did feel a calling to be a trainer. And then I felt a calling to be a trainer on leadership. So to explain, in my previous careers. I, I, I was a salesperson. I was successful at that. I was a sales manager. I was successful at that. I then went into staff positions and I met with some success, but not as much success previously. But one staff position that I got was a trainer with Xerox Corporation. At the time it was called Rank Xerox in Europe. And I did that for two years and I absolutely loved training because you could see the impact of your work. And then I went back into industry and I had several more assignments. I rose to the C-level in a, uh, a company. And then I was given the opportunity to uh, work on my own, which is code for I was let go. And so I, I started working on my own. I said, what am I going to do? And uh, then I knew I wanted to be a trainer. And I started picking up work right away, even from companies that I no longer work for. They say, well, we'd like to have you come back. And then I found that the biggest gap that people had as they ascended through the organization is they tried to manage when they should have led. And they weren't leading when they, or they were leading when they should have managed. So they weren't clear on what the differences were. And yet, for some reason, I was clear about the difference between managing and leading, and I started talking about that. And I, I just decided at that point I couldn't do anything else. It, it was, it, this may sound strange, but it, it really felt like I was assigned to do that because I couldn't imagine doing anything else, even though I could make significantly more money. The money wasn't the best form of compensation. The compensation was training leaders and then watching them become very effective. And in some cases, they have worldwide responsibilities in the organizations. And I still get notes saying, I had a lot to do with that. So th there's a compensation outside of monetary that I, I, I really probably enjoy more than the money. Although I like money, um, but it's uh, it it's an assignment. It's pure and simple an assignment, and um, I'm very happy that I got it. Yeah. And do you believe that we all have an assignment in in some way or another? I, I would like to say that. Here's why I wouldn't wholesale say yes, because. If you've got an assignment, you have to search for it. 
And I believe that there are people that don't search for. I believe that there are people that stay in a misery of a uh, stay in misery in a job that they absolutely hate. And if you get to know some of these people, you find all of these different talents that they have that they fail to capitalize on. Or if you ask them, well, if this is something that you don't like, why don't you do what it is that you do like? Oh, I'm too old to make the change now, or I have family responsibilities. And, and all of that is true. And I can't, I, I can't condemn them in any way for, you know, making the decision to stay in a job they like if they have other responsibilities. But yes, um, I do believe we have an assignment. I don't believe that everybody looks hard enough for it. And, and I, was, I was pretty lucky. Um, I found my assignment, you know, after the fifth or sixth career that I had or, or job that I had. I go, you know, I really like that training business. Um, and I also take that back to the fact that as a child, I had some very good teachers. I had some that weren't very good, but, you know, I, I, I learned as much from my managers and bosses who weren't very good and my teachers who weren't very good were, were learners to me or, or excuse me, were teachers to me. I, I learned from both the good and the bad, but I, I, I admire more the the good ones, and um, I had a lot of good teachers, a lot of good teachers. And you're talking about teachers, but you you you're actually using a resource of reading, and who you so say you're self teaching all of this time, and and what is it that you sort of take away from from that exercise of reading? Um, well, as I mentioned, I can go anywhere, be anybody at any time throughout history, depending on the book that I choose. But the other thing is, um, I learn an awful lot by the stories that are being told, not just the content, but the style of stories as they are told. Um, there's a famous actor, I'll give you an example, there's two examples, famous actor now, um, Matthew McConaughey, who recently released a book called Green Lights, which is really a reflection of 35 years of journaling. And it's not as much a story of him as an actor, although there's a lot of that in there. It's his role as a parent, as a husband, as a person. And what were the things that created this desire in him, which happened, by the way, to be a book, um, The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. He will say that book shifted his entire life. Um, that's that's one example. So, I, you know, I didn't know that much about Matthew McConaughey other than he's an excellent actor. And then there's another book that uh, I'm currently reading. Um, it, it Well, my favorite all-time book, and I think the most important book that people can read, um, is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is a, an incredible story of our ability to choose our reaction under any and all circumstances. He calls it the final freedom. It is part of the reason that I have had a number of silver linings occur to me, or I've seen a lot of silver linings in the pandemic. But there's a newer version of that experience by a woman named Dr. Elaine Egers, E-G-E-R-S, and her book is called Choices, and it was published in 2017. Her writing is luminous, her experience is as dark as dark can be, but her reaction similar to Viktor Frankl, and they were, by the way, contemporaries in Auschwitz, um, her, her lessons and what she learned and what she passes on are incredible. I would never have been exposed to that had I not been a reader. And, um, and, and so, you know, it's curiosity and it's lessons and lessons learned. I read an awful lot of Seneca, um, Epictetus, uh, Marcus Aurelius, because these are very ancient thinkers whose philosophy are perfectly appropriate for the times we are in right now, which is Stoicism. 
And by stoicism, we don't mean, you know, lack of reaction to anything and just say, that's the way it is. Stoicism is, is really about understanding what you can control and what you can't control. And then, of course, it feeds into Viktor Frankl's final freedom, which is to control your response. You have responsibility. And, and then uh, Dr. Egers takes it to a, a completely different level. Well, you know, I, I didn't learn stoicism. I didn't take much philosophy, even in university. Uh, but because I read and, and I read well-written versions uh, I just, I learn a lot and uh, it's helped me immensely, helped me immensely. It's funny because I'm actually listening to Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights at the same at the moment as well. So it's it's actually really entertaining because he he writes it so well and he re he, well he he reads it so well as well. It's really quite amusing and the stories some of them are quite harrowing to be fair, Al although not as harrowing as as poor Viktor Frankl, you know, in that sort of scenario right, right, in in right. Auschwitz. But again, you know, the importance of a man's search for meaning. It, it is a huge, and you, you talk about the responsibility and about our ability to choose our response. And that's something that I've noticed over the last year with the pandemic, that people have sort of not always chosen their response. They've allowed responses to be made for them. How have you found the, people's reactions and have you seen any, you talk about silver linings. What have been your silver linings? Well, I have also witnessed that some people have allowed the pandemic, which is serious, uh, um, very serious, uh, it, it has allowed them to be down, uh, get depressed, have more anxiety, um, even when they're not directly affected. We have had other people that are angry because they have, especially in America, the rugged individualists, I don't want to wear a mask. I have freedom not to wear a mask. Um, it, it's more I than we in, in many parts of America. Um, and so there's that anger that is there. Um, and, and, you know, the, the silver linings for me are, are, are many. Um, now, I want to qualify this by saying thus far, and in America, we knock on wood when we say something like I'm about to say, my family has not been directly touched by COVID yet. My friends have, but um, knock, knock, we have not yet. Um, but I have expanded my circle of friends to many, many in the UK. I've, I've gotten, developed new close friendships with people in Scotland, Ireland, uh, England, uh, Wales. Um, and then uh, on the West Coast, there's another group that I was led to from the UK group to the West Coast. And I meet with them every Wednesday. And it's a, it's a delightful group of people. And we have speakers that give real, real insights. And, you know, if I like to read, well, I like to hear interesting people too, like you presented a couple of weeks ago um, in Derek Arden's chat show. So you, there's a lot of learning that goes on. Now, keep in mind that I've had a lot of silver linings my assignment has helped me get the silver linings, but there have been people who also have an assignment. They work in healthcare and their assignment, which they felt strongly was to help people in the medical profession. And those people are just inundated with work and they're suffering tremendous fatigue. And, and I'm not sure that they can see as much of a silver lining as I can, or perhaps you can as well. Um, so, you know, just because you have an assignment doesn't mean that you're going to always have the, the joyful uh, experience on a day to day basis. The, we cannot say enough about the healthcare workers and the people that run the healthcare system or the various hospitals all around the world. They are trying to figure out how to handle this um, horrific pandemic. 
And you talk about the sort of obligation that they have. And again, it comes back to that assignment that you sort of you mentioned earlier that we do have and and the roles that we play. When I launched this podcast, I, I felt that there was a role that I had that I could play and, and use my network and share these sort of relatable, uplifting, inspiring conversations to reassure others and help them and guide them and in, inspire them to to help them discover their calling and their and and give them some kind of support because it was it was right at the beginning of lockdown and, and there was a lot of uncertainty around and you talk about your VUCA you talk about the, the sort of volatile the volatility and the, this uncertainty and the complexity and, and I guess also the ambiguity so with all of that I, I felt that there was a role for me and I didn't know where it was going to go, but that was OK. I just sort of let it go. What have you done sort of over the last few months? To what, what have I done to a little bit more specific? Yeah, in terms of create something or, or support people and use your skills and your sort of okay, genius. Yeah. Um, it, thank you. I have... Um, I have been busier as a friend than I have been before. Now, keep in mind, I, I moved 75 miles away, and yet I'm in touch with people that are close to me more than I was um, when I lived much closer to them, when we could go out for breakfast or out for lunch. Um, so I, I've tried to be a better friend, tried to be a better father, um, tr tried to be... Um, the very best husband that I can. Uh, I happen to be married to um, a registered nurse uh, who is an angel in terms of finding and treating medically complex patients um, who, in addition to brain injuries or spinal cord injuries, may also have COVID. So, you know, I, I've tried to be very, very supportive of her. Um, because she is incredibly supportive of all of her patients and her coworkers. So I've, I've you know, tried to do that. And I, I'm not looking for any medal or any recognition for that. It's just a question that you can always ask yourself at any time, especially in time of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. You can always ask yourself, what is mine to do? What is mine to do that I am capable of doing? Can I be a better husband, a better friend, a better father, a better trainer? If, as far as training is concerned, effective January first, I'm uh, you know I've been I've been successful at, at training as I've been training, but January first, I'm changing my entire delivery style. Uh, I'm I'm going more toward. Uh, you know, I'm driving the the me, excuse me, I'm dri driving the we versus the me. Uh, I want to train leaders to be more we focused than self focused and and show them the rewards of that. So uh, you, there's there's been a lot of reflection followed by action. You know, the ultimate truth is action uh, because we can learn things. But if we don't apply things we have, you know, we haven't served. And the pandemic gives us an opportunity to serve in many different ways. Uh, one thing that, and again, I, I say this with all humility, but I see it as mine to do, is when I go to the shops, when I go to the grocery store, um, I make it a point to be more pleasant than ever. Um, because, you know, we're separated in the United States, I'm pretty sure in England and the UK, by plexiglass, by where there are screens everywhere now, and we have masks on. And so it, it's so easy, easy to, to just make a little bit more effort to be nice, to be kind, to show gratitude, um, you know, to thank someone uh, for what they do. And uh, and I can tell by the reaction, they don't hear that a lot. And, you know, it couldn't be any, there's, there's nothing that would be easier to do. Just look them in the eye and say, hey, look, thanks for doing that. We, we have so many things delivered at home now. Well, I have this little box outside my house that has 
uh, drinks in it, candy bars, small bags of chips, and, uh, and you know, a little sign that says to delivery people, help yourself, thanks. If I'm home or I'm looking out the window when I see them out there, I'll walk out and personally hand it to them um, because they're busier than ever. And it's a, it's kind of a tough job. So uh, I, I think we can go out of our way to serve without inconveniencing ourselves that much. Because I will tell you this, if you are nice to somebody and they respond nicely back to you, it, it's, it, it feels great to you. It, 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 you know, say, well, you know, that was okay. That, that, that felt pretty good. You don't go away grumbling. And uh, I think we need to be there for each other. Um, again, more we, not I. And he started off by saying that you've been connecting and reconnecting, which is wonderful. And and often we can become disconnected. In fact, you know, I think that before the pandemic, I think we were heading towards a disconnection as a society for very many reasons. And this has brought everyone back together in a collect with a collective purpose. Well, your- it, it has the power to bring us back together, but not everybody has taken that opportunity. And I think we need to be aware, and, and uh, um, I will come off harsh here, but I do indict the media, especially in the U.S., that foments this divisiveness that is available. You, you know, we had a divisive president, we have divisive campaigns, we have divisive issues, and the media is is fomenting that. And, and um, I think we need to be very careful. They, they've even, you know, there's a lot of people that do nothing but read all of that negative that is being published. And it now has a name, it's called doom scrolling. And it actually has been shown to have a very negative effect on someone's mental health. So, um, you know, we have this opportunity to come together, but we're not going to be able to rely on the media to do that. It's got to be a one person, a one to one um, job. But I, I know it can be done, and I, I, I think it can be incredibly enjoyable. Um, and, and I'm not talking, you know, believe it or not, Amy, I am almost pathologically shy. Um, I don't speak to people when I used to get on airplanes, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm shy. Um, so I've had to crack out of that and really start speaking to people and asking them questions. And um, 90 times out of 100, nine times out of 10, they, they respond in a very positive way. Um, and I think it's a, a relief to them. So I, I think I think our job is to edify each other. Uh, I think we should, we're here to raise people up. Why would we knock anybody down? There's there's enough of that going on in the world. And Sorry, I got off on a little tangent there. <laughs> no, it's it's all valuable, it, and it's 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 really important that you're able to sort of share your experiences because other people will be listening to that and thinking oh so it's not just me that's looking at this media and realizing that it's having this huge negative effect on me and and doom scrolling is an actual thing I I haven't looked at the news for for months on years in fact because I I just find it so negative and I you know I hear of things of course and occasionally I'll I'll catch the news if somebody else is listening to in the house but I I take an active view that I, I put all the content that into sort of my mind that is of value. And that comes from many different sources and the news is, is not necessarily one of them. Yeah. And, and that is literally why I'm, uh, I'm very careful about what I read in the morning for the first half hour awake and for the last half hour. Um, I'm, I'm very careful about you know, there's certain websites that I won't go to. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't go to, uh, I'm off social media for at least a half hour before I go to bed. Also in the morning, um, I have a series of books uh, that I spend some time with that give me um, high thought, what I would call high thought, which is positive thoughts, something to ponder, um, something to make me think 
um, but generally is positive, insightful, reflective. And um, I think how we how we start the day and how we end the day, I think we have to be very judicious in how we handle that time. Um, because you can start the day off on the wrong foot, as they say. Well, watching the news pretty much assures you you're going to be off on the wrong foot. You know, if the story is big enough, it's going to find you. Um, you're going to hear about it, but uh, don't go searching for it. Don't go looking for it. No, it's absolutely true. And I do rely on other people to sort of fill me in with anything that's relevant or important. But I don't spend my time looking at the news because it, it does create that sort of anxiety that you you, you can't take any effect on things as an individual but mm -hmm. what i can do is i can i can take action in my own way and this this show is my way of creating ripple effects to, sure. across across the world and you know connecting with someone like yourself which we did back in sort of september october now and we we've we've been sort of having weekly sessions where we've been able to connect and talk about various subjects of which have been invaluable have been really great yeah i i think that that a person has an opportunity to be a pebble, not a big old rock, but a, a little bit of a pebble. You're a pebble, I try to be a pebble. Toss it into the quiet stream or even the rolling stream. It will create that ripple effect. And I think this podcast is a good example of this, which gets us to ask why. Why are we doing this? Or find out why other people are why. Be, you know, even the grumpy person, even the person who is essentially negative, you wonder why they are that way. Well, it's because they get something from it. I mean, I know of friends that that go on Facebook and, and just to complain, and then all of their friends say, oh, I can't believe that happening. I feel so bad. I'll put you on my prayer list. You're in my thoughts. They which is exactly what they want. And, and so, it, you know, you ask a person why they do something or try to figure out why, I think that's really, really important. And then I think it comes to a point where people don't wanna know why, but they do wanna know how well. And I, I'll give you an example. I, I teach and train executive education at the university level, Southern Methodist University uh, School of Business. And, and I also teach executives uh, of, of many other major companies. Now, the, way, the reason that I do that, we've already covered that. I was called to that. But they, as executives sitting in my sessions, at that point that they're at my sessions, they don't really wonder why. They want to know how well. How good is this guy at training? How good is this guy's material? How good is he at delivering the content in a way that I can absorb it and then I can use it? So there's always, after a while, um, they want to know how good. And it, it's more important to them, we're just a vessel. And we have to understand that that we are the conduit for positive, conduit for information, conduit for um, application, whatever. And I know, I, I don't know how to translate this into metric, but there's this wonderful example of, uh, you know, I could hold up a drill bit. A drill bit, um, there's a quarter inch drill bit. Like I said, I, don't, I can't, I don't know what that is in metric, but Six million people in the United States in 2020 have bought a quarter inch drill bit. Six million, but not a single one of them wanted a quarter inch drill bit. What they wanted was a quarter inch hole. And I think we need to understand, are we the drill bit or do they want the whole? And, and so the drill bit is the wide, the best drill bit possible so that they can get the what, um, which is the, the quarter inch hole that they need to mount something or, or make something. And, and I, I think that the idea of being a vessel, I personally find that exciting. Um, and so I want to be the best vessel that I can, and I continuously uh, look for ways to improve. And of course, I always study other masterful teachers. Um, and I got a lot out of Matthew McConaughey's book. He's, he's quite, the, uh, quite the good teacher. <laughs> and, and with that, 
it leads nicely sort of back to where you started, where you, you said you, you're just about to bring out your second book, which is Points of Impact. And, you know, it's not necessarily a whole, it's a point, it's, a, it's, the, it's the impact that you're creating. What does impact mean for you? Impact means that it will make a difference. Uh, it, and hopefully it'll make a big difference. Uh, but for example, one of my clients is a hospital in a small town in Kentucky. Now the entire town exists in a crater that is five and a half miles across. That crater was created approximately 55 million years ago by a meteor or an asteroid that hit that area. Now that meteor or asteroid was, I don't know what's the proper is, was one meter across. It was 39 inches. So one meter creates a five and a half mile crater. Um, that's impact, all right? But one idea that you share, that I share, that gives somebody an opportunity to change direction, uh, to have an impact in their professional life or, or maybe even their personal life, um, it, it's, it's, it's really having an impact. And I believe that the biggest impact lessons come from short sentences, ideas, almost like bumper stickers. And that's what literally what my book, um, Points of Impact, is going to be. It's, it's like, give you an example. Um, people ask me the difference between leading and managing. And I say, leaders provide light managers provide heat. And a lot of times, you know, if we get too much heat, um, we, we burn up, burn out, uh, quit, but stay. Um, so that, you know, that's one of my points. Um, another one is somebody appoints you or appointed you to be their manager, but only the people that you manage can decide whether or not you're their leader. So uh, I want leaders to, to be thinking about these ideas. And, uh, you, you know, my goal is that they'll open up the book to any page. They'll read something and they'll go, I got to think about that. <laughs> and so um, it's taken five years to come up with uh, just over 100 ideas um, that, uh, that, you know, they had to audition into the book, uh, they, it, you know, just because it was a good idea. And uh, some of them in revision fall out, but we'll see. Um, you, you know, it's not a, it, it's, um, it's going to be self-published. Um, you know, I, I'm just kind of anxious to see what will happen with it. Um, and, uh, you, you know, thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a great book. And, and I feel, you know, we've, in the short time that we've spoken today, we've covered a, a sort of a, such a diverse amount of topics. We've talked about assignments. We've talked about obligation. We've talked about calling. We've talked about choices. We've talked about responsibility. It's been fantastic. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show, Tim. How would people get in contact with you? Well, first of all, thank you, Amy, not just for inviting me on the show, but for just creating this show. I, th I think it's been uh, uh, a bright light. Um, and you, you know, I think we need to provide light instead of throw shade. And uh, you have done that consistently, and you've certainly done this with the show. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is Tim at timdurkin.com. Um, it's, it's my email address. Um, and it's just very easy to do that. I am on LinkedIn, Tim Durkin Speaker. Um, I'm not, I, I have a Twitter handle at Tim Durkin, but I, uh, I don't tweet very much. Uh, I'm of the generation, I believe, that not very good at tweeting. Um, but, you know, it's just Tim at TimDurkin.com. Um, and they can go to my website and, and get some information, TimDurkin.com. Well, I'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes alongside the two book choices, well, several book choices that you've, you've shared with us today. One was Choices by Dr. E Edith Eagers. There's been Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Was there anything else? Yes, there's two. Uh, number one uh, would be The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I had the 
honor to work around Stephen when he was writing that book. Uh, he and I became very good friends, and um, he is a magnificent man. But even though it's the 30th anniversary of that book, I believe that it's more appropriate now than it was 30 years ago. I think it's time. Well, it's been the best business selling book of all times, but I think it's time is really now. And then there's another book. Uh, there's there's actually two by, uh, and we'll put this in the show notes, by uh, a person by the name of Lanny, L-A-N-N-Y, Basham, B-A-S-S-H-A-M. And he, he's a uh, an Olympic champion, gold medal. But more importantly, he used what he learned to become an Olympic champion because he was first an Olympic failure, silver medalist, if you can believe that, and how he wanted to become a gold medalist and how he did. And then he codified all of the things that he learned to manage his mental state. So it's Lanny Basham's with winning in mind. And if anybody has children, Lanny's uh, latest book is called Parenting Champions. Um, I highly recommend both of those books and and also mentalmanagement.com. Uh, there's a lot of information there, but Lanny has gone on. He's probably, he's easily trained over a hundred world Olympic international champions uh, from all different countries. And uh, so, so those are some resources that people can use if they apply the lessons and get dramatically different results in 2021. Well, that's a fantastic set of resources there. And I'll make sure all of those links go into the show notes. And I will be definitely recommending that my children sort of take up the, the those books. And also, I will be looking at the Parenting Champions. You know, I, I, I was talking to you before we recorded about Viktor Frankl. And you, you mentioned that it should be something that all teenagers should read. And you know, I said that I just sort of recommended highly slash forced my daughter to read it because she'd been to Auschwitz earlier this year and I thought that this would be an, an extra level for her. And actually it's been really, and she's also studying classics, so she's always in the world of the Stoics and she knows Seneca very well, so fantastic, but yeah. yes. I, I literally believe, and, and you know, if I were... Um, I don't, I don't want to say if I were king because you, you understand royalty very well. But if I were in charge of the world, I would have the teenagers read it. And at the same time, the parents read it. And then everybody talk about it. Uh, what are the lessons provided? Because, as you know, it's a it's a one night read, but it will stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, the, the idea of final freedom, responsibility, um, especially teenagers, you know, because they're they're, you know, pretty impulsive and they're faced with a lot of decisions. So, yes, um, I know you well, have to cut off. Me, no, me. that's fine. I was just going to say, you know, that's a fantastic, it's a fantastic way to almost finish because there is wisdom on every page with, with Viktor Frankl's book. And, and with that sort of segue, I'd just like to ask you to sort of, with a final few words, to share for us a, a sort of a, a piece of wisdom from Tim Durkin, please. I, I, uh, yes, I always like to tell my classes, and when things you know things go right and people start accomplishing things, that once you reach a certain level, you have to send the lift, the elevator back down. Okay, you really need to help other people. You need to extend an arm down a, a, instead of a hand out. And you need to, I think it's, it, it's very important for us to help other people rise to the level um, or pass the level uh, that, that we have reached. Uh, and I remind people, you know, the Dead Sea is dead because water flows into it, but doesn't flow out of it. And I believe if we help other people get on the lift and mentor them, number one, you know, the water will flow, the wisdom will flow. Um, but in my case, the greatest joy that I've had in my career, in my life almost, except my children, grandchildren, is 
to have put somebody on the lift and watch them blow right past the floor that I ended up on. <laughs> and uh, and many of them have. So, uh, yeah, once you reach a certain level, you have to send the lift back down. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20 minute coaching call via calendly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.